Okay, thank you. So uh, this is a, a case of uh, a ureteral stricture. Uh, and bear with me, I'm sorry, the slides are slightly out of order. Uh, but we'll, uh, we'll take a look at this case. So for the panelists, the story for this patient, uh, this is a case of a ureteral stricture, and this is a patient who is 60 years old, uh, who had a laser lithotripsy procedure, ureteroscopy at an outside hospital, uh, for a one centimeter proximal ureteral stone, had a stent placed, and then got sick with uh, acute cholangitis. Just totally unrelated. But the point was he was hospitalized for a long time, uh, and actually the stent stayed in for almost six months before it was removed. His outside urologist decided to try to remove that stent in the office. It was a little bit hard to remove it, but he pulled really hard, and he essentially got most of the stent except for maybe a little portion of the proximal curl of the stent. And so the patient then later went on to develop a hydronephrosis uh, and required a percutaneous nephrostomy. And so uh, we already have some information up here on the slide. But on the left, that is us performing a retrograde pilogram, okay? And as we can see in the upper portion of the distal ureter, there's a complete obliteration of, uh, of the ureter. So I guess I would ask uh, Dr. Winkler, what would you propose at this uh, point? Well, if, if, I, if I try to imagine the, the scenario here, the, what has happened to a while uh, trying to remove the stent, the, the calcified uh, stent, probably they evolved the part of the ureter. I, I may suspect. So, uh, I, 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 having this derifosomy in, I, I would go and do an anti-grade pilogram to, to be able to assess correctly the, the, the level of obstruction, the length of stricture, and then to, to consider the, the, the correct approach. Uh, I wouldn't just blame the impacted stone for the stricture. We know the literature, it's about 20, 21% called the Johns Hopkins, all the uh, serious that uh, impacted stones might then uh, cause, or laser literature, we've seen those cases, may, may develop to a stricture. But these are usually short ones. In this case, I would uh, 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 I think that the uh, traction or the removal or the, the trial to remove it, the stent, uh, caused this uh, 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 damage to the ureter, and I, I need to, to have a, an undergrade first uh, pilogram to, to learn better the what's going inside. Agreed. And uh, when I met this patient in the clinic, he did just come in with the percutaneous drain, and in my mind, just like you was, was my, my question was, was that stone completely treated or not in the ureter? And, you know, what was the degree of hydronephrosis and how good was this kidney with regard to its function at this point? So what I did was I ordered a CAT scan and I also ordered a renal scan to get the split function. It turns out that that was a, a kidney that was about 25% split function. Uh, and it did not appear as though there were any calcifications along the expected course of the ureter, but it did appear that there were some stone fragments in the kidney. Okay, so just like you, uh, you outlined, I also wanted to take the patient for an anti-grade study since the perk was already there. And then for the rest of the panelists and for the audience, this is an essentially, we, we have him in the operating room uh, in a modified lithotomy position so that we can approach him from below as well as from above at the same time. And these are simultaneous retrograde and anti-grade studies that you can see. So essentially what we're doing here is we're trying to define the length of ureter that's compromised. So, um, let's see. So for the second panelist, what, what are your thoughts, sir, on, on this? So it's a, it's a relatively short ureteral defect uh, in the upper distal to mid, lower mid ureter. I think basically this is a very difficult situation because of the um, mechanism of the trauma. Because I think this is one of the things we need to consider when we discuss ureteral strictures. Um, Dr. Winkler mentioned the 21% rate post-impaction. Obviously, this is not the case, but even the 21%, I doubt 
because uh, there is some discrepancy if you think about it in the literature. If you talk about the 21% uh, stricture rate after impaction and then you look at the stricture rate reported today after your atroscopy, which should be less than 1%, we have some discrepancy. So I think this 21% is old data and, and, and probably uh, it is much lower just for the stone itself. But the mechanism here is completely different and perhaps in this case I would even consider beforehand whether an endurological solution is the solution because thinking about the mechanism, thinking about the area of stricture which although looks relatively uh, uh, short and probably may allow a technique of cut to the light or coming from both sides and, and bridging the gap, I, I, w I would really have a long discussion with the patient before proceeding with treatment whether endurological intervention is the solution for long term or whether this is the case to resort to um, traditional surgery which is cutting the um, segment which is uh, injured. Okay. Uh, Ivan, what do you think? Well, I, I agree. I, I think, I mean, since it looks like it's a pretty short structure, I think my preference would be to try to cut to the light and try to do this endoscopically, but uh, definitely we have to have a discussion with the patient and they have to understand the, the, that there's still potential they will need something more invasive. Okay. And, sir, your opinion? Yes, uh, I agree with the previous speakers, but this is an endourological session, so let's try to treat this patient. And my concern is about the location of the stricture. The stricture appears to be very short, but it is located probably adjacent to um, uh, the iliac vessels. And uh, we should be very careful if you uh, choose to go endoscopically, maybe a combined approach, retrogradely and uh, antegrade approach with two endoscopic uh, instruments will be the best uh, way to go. Uh, trying to assess where are the pulsations uh, and, uh, of course, uh, to cut anteriorly. Okay. Comment? I would say we, we should, well, we always uh, consider or we study the what's going inside the ureter. We should consider always or not, not forget the, the what's going outside the ureter. In, in this case, since we do not have uh, the, the effect of irradiation or a previous surgery from the outside and the, probably the tissue, the outside tissue, uh, surrounding that area is uh, healthy, we vascularize. I would go and do in a short stricture uh, as first choice and endoyotratomy and not uh, consider an open surgery. Uh, otherwise, the, there are many other causes for that uh, area, structured area. Uh, I just uh, would like to, to ask you would you use a, a, a regular stand and after? or use an endourotrotomy stent as we use usually for the UPJ obstructions. Does it matter? Well, I can tell you what we did in this case. Uh, we actually did bridge the gap, and I'll show you some pictures, but afterwards what we did was we actually placed two parallel stents, six French each, to try to really open that up, which would be akin, uh, I guess, to an endopilotomy stent, which at least at the top is, I think, 14 French is what I've seen. I still would like to uh, play the devil advocate and, and, and look at the literature and one of the parameters that may uh, predict long-term success of such treatment is the, is the renal function, at least in some of the studies. And, and as you mentioned, the uh, renal scan showed your poor renal function, relatively poor renal function. So again, if we think about long-term success, this case might have some predictors that uh, may predict failure, and again, that would require a long discussion with the patient. Can I have a comment, please? So I agree with the panel about a definitive choice for this uh, uh, structure. However, we should not ignore the, the fact that you said that there are residual fragments in the kidney. Mm -hmm. So if we will bridge the gap in uh, open surgery or lap laparoscopic surgery, we will still have fragments in the kidney, maybe stones. I don't know the numbers because you haven't mentioned. Mm -hmm. So this is an excuse for me to try to go perk. 
and to clear the kidney, and in that case, I can really easily visualize the stricture from above and do a very, very gentle maneuver to try to pass a wire or something like that. I would not cut to the light in, in that area, but if it goes fine, I would uh, dilate, cut with a laser, and put a stent or two or any, kind, any other kind of stent. If it's not, so it is going to a definitive surgery, but without any fragment in the kidney. Yeah, that's a great point. So what we did here was we did approach it uh, from above and below simultaneously. And uh, we did take a close look in the kidney and we found small residual fragments, nothing greater than a centimeter, but we found the rest of the proximal portion of that stent. It snapped off and it somehow made its way up into the kidney. So we were able to remove that foreign body with the percutaneous access, clear the stone burden, like you were saying, and then at the same time what we did was uh, we had two flexible ureteroscopes and we carefully measured you know, the distance between the two and it's about a centimeter right there as you can see. And we were able successfully to cut to the light to recannulize this ureter endoscopically, keeping in mind that it would be close to the iliac vessels and we tried our best to stay in the anterior portion of the ureter. But we were ultimately able to recannulate, get a wire through, as you can see, we balloon dilated the area and then left two stents. Comment? Uh, just a comment and a question. Uh, I think the success rate for an endourologic procedure would be based on the length of time that that stricture has been there. If you've caught that patient relatively soon after the stent broke off, then I, I think your success rate with endourologic procedure would be quite high. If I think he showed up at your door six months or more after uh, complaining of renal colic and then you picked up the stricture? Well, uh, he, he actually came with a perk tube in place, uh, you know, and at that point was just looking at, you know, to get the tube out, but your point's well taken. Six months went by, yeah. All right. my, my question also for the panel is how would you prefer to treat this stricture? Would you prefer to balloon it, to laser it, to cut it? I'm just curious what each of you think uh, the best approach would be. Well, uh, uh, Looking back uh, to the history of uh, treating strictures, uh, ballooning only doesn't uh, uh, make the, 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 resolve the problem. So you have to cut it, cut through, uh, and uh, to, to perforate uh, directly or uh, uh, control the perforation or incision of that uh, 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 structured area and leaving a stand, that's the, the only chance uh, that switch might be uh, 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 then uh, treated and uh, successfully uh, uh, with success uh, outcome. Uh, otherwise, I don't see any, any, any uh, reason to, to just dilate it and to leave that uh, uh, atonic fibrotic segment. Uh, you may not... Uh, have uh, uh, quite success that we would expect to. Um, I agree with Dr. Winkler. I, I would do both. Um, the literature, uh, the, the, the um, series in the literature are relatively small. We've published one of the largest one with 35 and the urotrotomies using laser. And so the technique uh, and, and what we found that we were using um, uh, balloon dilation as well as uh, laser uh, and the urotrotomy. And we had fairly well um, long-term results um, with shorter stricture going below one centimeter could reach about 80%. Um, so I think that's, that's the data out there that you better use both because you, when you cut, you still may have some fibers and you may not be able to cut all the way through. Let's say in such a case, we're a little bit afraid of hitting surrounding tissues and then the balloon dilation will maybe uh, disrupt the remaining fibers and make sure that you really did a good work. I agree. I think that <clears throat> balloon dilation itself has been pretty much clearly shown that it has no uh, long-term results positive results, but um, the, I think it mostly helps with uh, being able to uh, uh, give you access to the instrumentation so you can do the, the, use the laser to cut. Uh, so the combination definitely works, but uh, I would not not use balloon dilation alone. Simon. Okay. Uh, just one question. 
Why you use two stents and not the single one endourotomy, endopilotomy stent that is... Uh, you think that it's better to use two stents? Well, there's, there's no data, but what we feel is though with the two stents in the ureter, we have two lumens and we also have the space above and below where the two stents would meet medially and we figured that that gives us better patency. Uh, but you're right, there's no basic science behind it. Um, I think we're out of time, uh, so thank you for your attention. <laughs>